Francis, it's the 28th. Everyone's going to be signing the treaty today. Um, can you tell me how you feel to uh, that this the, that the treaty's uh, been approved and? Uh, wonderful, wonderful actually. I'm going to say this morning at the signing ceremony that uh, like all of the rest of the staff, I am very proud to be part of an organisation whose members could have concluded this treaty. Or have concluded this treaty actually. You've worked on a lot of issues in the past before you were Director General of, the, of this organisation. Uh, I remember that on issues relating to the internet you played a, uh, a critical role in the <coughs> the innovation of, of trying to resolve trademark disputes on uh, internet domain names and uh, you've worked a lot in the patent area. How would you compare this project yeah. and this treaty to the other things you've worked on professionally mm. on the, in the area of intellectual mm. property? Well, uh, this is perhaps one of the most rewarding, if not the most rewarding, because it has a very concrete and positive impact on, on a, a community that really uh, has been unnecessarily excluded from our literary culture. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, that for many of us, not, not the whole world, but for many of us, that literary culture starts with a blind author, Homer. Uh, and so it's very, very appropriate that we find a way in the international community to be able to include in the literary culture to the full extent or the greatest extent possible uh, blind and visually impaired and print disabled persons. Did you think in 2008, 2009 that this negotiation would be as challenging as it was? Uh, no, I didn't because I thought that the, uh, you know, the, the problem that we've set out to solve, I thought it was such an obvious case of uh, an area that needed international attention and needed international action. So I thought that, that it would be rather easy, easier to translate what I, what, I th what I think has become the political consensus about the need for action into an operational system. But that, as you know, has been a very difficult thing to do. So uh, in many ways, this process is you know, typical of what happens in a multilateral process. You get this convergence of diverse interests upon a particular subject matter, and the subject matter becomes a proxy field for a lot of other things. Uh, and and uh, it's a sign, I think, of great ma political maturity in the organisation that member states were actually able to arbitrate amongst those diverse interests and reconcile them and come out with an effective operational system, you know, that is going to work and it's going to have a, a positive impact and I think that still respects the architecture of the international copyright system. In the negotiation, uh there seemed to be a, uh, uh, in the beginning it seemed that like there was a, a developing country position on the one hand and a group <coughs> position yeah. on the other, but as, it, as a negotiation evolved, that seemed to change and, yeah. and, and we began to see a number, uh, uh, a much greater diversity in the viewpoints of the group B countries. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right and I think that's appropriate by the way. And, and I would say, uh, you know, that this cleavage between developed and developing is, is uh, really to some extent artificial. Well, it is artificial. You know, we have really a spectrum, a spectrum, a continuum. <coughs> we don't have two camps. That's, that's the reality. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges, I think, for multilateralism is to get a better reflection of the diversity of interests in the political architecture so that it isn't just two camps that tend to, I think, uh, create divisions that don't always need to exist. Was there anything in the negotiation this week that surprised you? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, we're all slightly surprised by how good the result is. I mean, it's, it's a really good result. Uh, and I don't see anyone unhappy. Well, that's and uh, and it's a, that's a very rare thing. I mean, usually what happens in a multilateral process when you get a result is that everyone is equally unhappy. And I think this time, it's a rare thing has happened, everyone is equally happy. What do you think the impact was of, of many blind people attending the meetings, uh, making their, uh, talking about their personal experiences and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, socializing with the delegates? Great, I think that was, that was absolutely essential, had a you know, very profound influence on the, on the negotiations.
I think, first of all, of course, from the point of view of emotional symp symp sympathy and people understanding what the issues were. But uh, more generally, I think civil society has played an extremely important role in this whole process, as you know. Uh, extremely uh, important role. And I think that, that uh, increasingly what you need to have a successful multilateral process is not just the engagement and commitment of the member states, but you need the engagement and commitment of all those sectors of society who are affected by or involved with the negotiation. They're the ones that bring the reality check to uh, member state negotiations. I mean, this is part of the generalised shift, if you like, away from states possessing all the power to a diffusion of power <coughs> in society. And we have to reflect that also in multilateral processes. Of course, the decisions are taken by states at the end of the day. But we do need a multi-stakeholder engagement. WIPO is now seen as the most transparent international forum for norm setting for intellectual property, making the text available often on a daily or even more than daily basis, providing uh, great access by the uh, observers and NGOs who, who show up to interact with the delegates, um, and having uh, uh, a lot of information disseminated directly through the web page. Mm -hmm. Yet, uh, it, most of the negotiations here were, were handled, were, were done off, mm -hmm. either off the record mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. real secrecy. Yeah. And I'm assuming that the record of this negotiation will be very thin as, yep. as regard to what happened in the negotiations. Yeah. Could you reflect a bit on the, yeah. the fact that on the one hand, WIPO is is the best. I mean, it's 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 really the most transparent. And on the other hand, you have a, almost no record of what happened yeah. in this negotiation. Yeah, I, I uh, hear that, and I, I heard what you said yesterday about this, and I think it's it's an you know it's a it's a very accurate reflection. But I think member states do need some com comfort zone to be able to explore options without having interest groups reporting them to their government and saying, you know what, they're saying this, they're saying that, and they're talking about doing this and they're talking do about doing that. I think they need a comfort zone of exploration which can only take place in a fairly confident confidential setting. Uh, so I, I don't see any way in which we can go away from that if we're going to get results. Otherwise, they, they'll, it'll be a wooden negotiation. On the other hand, we do need a record of what has happened, which is other than folklore. Uh, and um, we'll reflect on that. I'm not sure how we, how we deal with it. There were some sessions, and they were quite important, where there was an audio feed, and WIPO has been doing this uh, recently in the negotiations on traditional knowledge or uh, and in, in, in this process too, where uh, the, the negotiators will be in a room having a conversation, and we'll have an audio feed in a different room, sometimes a text as well about uh, yeah. what's being said, but there's a uh, more or less a non-disclosure uh, mm. uh, rule mm. that you cannot mm. report on social media. But in those cases, the, uh, the lobbyists uh, that represent different industry groups are in a position to make those calls and report back to uh, Governments, what's happening in, in, in the room, but the general public is really uh, not only not aware of what their country's doing, but they don't even know what's being discussed or, mm. or what the controversy mm. are. Mm. We have asked in several occasions that they consider a, a Chatham House rule for those kind of settings where yeah. that's, that's a situation where <clears throat> there is no real secrecy about what the country positions are to the advocates and to the, uh, to the lobbyists, but the general public has it, it is more or less uh, really knows practically nothing. and. The other Chatham House rule, as you know, you can report the topics that are being discussed, yep. the arguments that are being made, but you can't attribute discuss them. who attribute them to yep. anyone. Yeah. Well, look, I think, uh, you know, the way to look at this question at this stage is that we're in a transition, you know, we're exploring process. Uh, you know, the transition is, I think, the, the one to greater involvement of stakeholders other than states. It's a very sensitive uh, subject because uh, some of the developing countries, for example, will say, well, we just don't have such well-resourced and well-represented well segments of civil society. So uh, there is a slight bias towards the developed countries' um, interest groups. Uh, that's and, and that's true, so we have to be sensitive to that. Uh, uh, while nevertheless bringing in other segments of, uh, into the process. Uh, you know, strangely, 
a hundred years ago almost, in 1924 I think it was, the Secretary of State, State then Secretary of State in the United States, Eli Root, uh, wrote that, you know, uh, the, the game has changed in multilateral negotiations or international discussions as they were then called in international discussions because they could no longer take place in a non-transparent environment. You know, media was such, and this is a hundred years ago, uh, that newspapers would be reporting back what negotiators were doing and there would be a question of accountability uh, and the game was changed. Well, a hundred years later, of course, this is accelerated and magnified uh, to a much, much greater degree. And I think we're just, we're in the process of exploration at this stage and we need to uh, adjust our processes as we go, but, uh, you know, at, at the multilateral pace, which is one in which everyone can be comfortable. Could you react to the issue of, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, or discuss the topic of precedent because uh, uh, we have not seen a real slippery slope in any international negotiations. Yeah. We, we look at everything yeah. as, as very difficult and I think yeah. when we look at the we contrast, for example, the Beijing agreement and this agreement. Yeah. It's not as if everything was automatically ported yeah. from one agreement yeah. to the other. And I was just wondering if you could, we recognize that everything in a way is a precedent, but it's yeah. it's not really a slippery slope either. And I was wondering if you could yeah. put, put that in perspective. Yeah, look, I'm not a great believer in the slippery slope. Uh, I believe we have to do things one at a time. Uh, you know, why has there been a success? I think it's because we had here a clearly defined, clearly articulated, manageable problem that required international action, and we had a political consensus around that. And that's the sort of condition precedent to having a successful negotiation, I think. And um, I don't see that there is any clearly defined, you know, consensus around a the whole problem that is sometimes mentioned uh, of exceptions or limitations or whatever else it might be, you know, rebalancing, that's not the case. I think we've got to take issue by issue, one at a time. What we got here is the consensus that this was a problem, the book famine, that really needed to be addressed. And as I say, they had the political maturity to address it and in a very effective manner. And I think that's a great result. Now we will slowly move to, or quickly, I hope, move to the next question and try to form a consensus around a clearly identified, you know, problem that needs international action. When I first started coming to WIPO, I used to hear more comments from uh, European countries and a, a, some diversity of views among different members of whether it was listening to France, listening to Germany, listening to uh, mm. Sweden, mm. or uh, the uh, Finnish delegation. And uh, today we just have the, uh, often, uh, only the uh, European yeah. Commission speaking mm. on behalf mm. of the, its mm. member states. Could you comment on, on how that's changed the uh, nature of discussions in WIPO? Yeah, well, look, um, it's not my field. Um, we take what the member states give us and, at the, and the Europeans have decided to adopt this configuration and, and that must be respected. Uh, but obviously uh, the process of coordination amongst the Europeans is an intense uh, process that requires a lot of discussion. So what we see coming out the end in a unified position is not going to reflect necessarily the richness of the discussion that has preceded that in order to form the single position. So this is, to that extent, you know, we, we ha have a, a little bit less of uh, a window into the full spectrum of views that might occur within the European Union, but that's what being a single entity is about. Uh, have you seen a change in the in the role of the African group in the last 10 years in these discussions? Well, there, I think, yeah, the a Africans are very involved, very involved in WIPO, and I think what we're seeing in Africa is uh, growth rates, economic growth rates stabilizing, which is a great thing, you know, it's not, not a fluke. It's, it's a, uh, Africa is, I think, the fastest growing region in the world at the moment. Um, and uh, this is going to change a lot of things. There's a lot of interest on the part of the rest of the world in Africa, a lot of investment in Africa, a lot of things happening. Uh, 
Uh, and what we will see is uh, African economies increasingly looking to see how they can add value. How they can add value rather than just dig out of the ground as a resource economy and sell overseas or be agriculturally based. It's a long process, but intellectual property is extremely important in that process because it really focuses on the value added. Um, and so I think this is one of the reasons we're seeing more interest coming from African countries. And then of course in the cultural and creative industries, they have fantastic you know, performers, uh, fantastic artists, authors, musicians, uh, but they don't, as we say, monetize all of that very well at the moment. And again, I think intellectual property has a very crucial role to play in enabling them to get their creative produce into global markets and uh, to monetize it to a much greater extent, which I think will uh, result in a much better quality of life for all African performers. I was thinking in this, in this negotiation how countries like Australia, uh, Switzerland, uh, occasionally Canada, uh, uh, Singapore certainly would yeah. uh, uh, stake out a much more independent role from Europe and the United States, for example, which are yep. the, the, the sort of more powerful entities in Group B. Yeah. And uh, do you have any reflections on, on the role of countries that are mm. not, not, not either in mm. the United States, either they're, they're not part of the United States, <laughs> or really, not yet. And, they're not, and, they're, and, yeah. and they're not part of the European Union yet. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think this is part of what I said before about the, you know, the artificiality of having just two blocks and considering that each block has a, has a homo homogeneity of interest. They don't. I mean, there is a spectrum in there. Uh, and so uh, if you take you know, a country like Australia, and I'm not speaking for Australia, uh, uh, their positions, but of course it's a country with 23 million people, so it, it's a, and an island. Uh, and one of its concerns is to create a viable market in the country itself uh, and to have a viable publishing industry uh, but to look after, you know, to have a, a proper quality of life that looks after all the disadvantaged parts of the community. And I think that's a very different context and set of uh, economics and social circumstances from what you might find uh, in the United States or Europe. There's a lot of similarities, but there's also differences. Uh, and so it's fairly normal, I think, that we see nuances of opinion. Broadly speaking, there are two camps, you could say that, broadly speaking. But within the two camps on either side, you see a spectrum and, and, and uh, nuances that I think will become more pronounced in the course of time. When we look at the Asian group to us, it's the most uh, diverse group in terms of their Yeah, yeah. Uh, Asia, yeah, absolutely. <coughs> everything. It's got everything from LDCs to, you know, um, uh, Brunei, uh, which is a uh, has one of the highest per capita incomes uh, uh, in, in the world, or Singapore. Uh, it's got the full spectrum, the most populous, the least populous. Uh, so it's, uh, but it's, it's e extremely dynamic. And as we all know, you know, it is the uh, Asian century. Uh, and that is happening. And we see it uh, also expressed in intellectual property. We see uh, great interest. I mean, if you look at the ASEAN intellectual property plan, uh, they are really looking uh, uh, at coming into the international system uh, in a major way, joining the, the agreements, the Madrid Agreement, the Hague Agreement and so on, uh, coming into it in a major way. But, uh, you know, it will be with an ASEAN focus and with an ASEAN perspective. There was a big debate here about, uh, or I would say a debate, but there was some, some cons uh, discussion about the role of general exceptions versus yeah. specific exceptions mm. as it relates to blind people, but I think that's a broader <coughs> thing. I was wondering if you could explain to somebody that wasn't a specialist in intellectual property um, what that what, what that is and how and how how different countries have really approached this. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, as you know, if you take a country like the United States, uh, it tends to have a generalized exception with fair use and and. Uh, and they have a very well-developed case law, uh, developed over decades, for uh, 40 years, uh, about how to interpret what fair use means. Uh, the um, European approach, or at least the continental European approach, tends, of course, 
to be to enumerate specifically the exceptions. So you can have an exception for visually impaired persons. You can have an exception in certain circumstances for educational materials. You can have an exception, and they list all of the all of the exceptions. Uh, so it's just a, a difference of technique and legislative technique, I think. Now at the international level, in the Berne Convention, the famous Article 9.2 has a general exception. It sets out a general test, which enables countries to translate that into their national tr legal traditions and adopt either specific uh, uh, tests, specific, specific exceptions, or have the generalised approach of, of, of the US. It's, it's up to them at the national level uh, to do this. So that's the debate. It's two different legal traditions as we so often get uh, in the world. Um, and I don't think one's right and one's wrong. Um, but uh, you have to exercise a certain amount of care about just switching from one to the other without the cultural context. Uh, I think we're going we're gonna, we to, okay. film my film here. we have to conclude this now, but before we uh, turn off the camera, I'd like to ask you if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, no, I look, I really am in a, um, a moment of profound gratitude, you know, to the member states, first of all, for having had, as I said, the political maturity to be able to do a deal like this. Uh, to all of the aspect, all of the elements of civil society for their participation in this. I mean, we've got, we've had a process which is an exemplary run. It sets a very high standard for us. Uh, we have to try to focus and reproduce uh, that sort of a process for other questions in the future, and that's not going to be easy. Thank you very much. Thank you.